Nature is the great thing we can take resource from. Here's the iPhone 14, don't question it. So you can start to see the polarities between action and inaction, where inaction is just a point of comfort, it's a point of complacency. Warning, this show contains upfront and unfiltered opinions. I'm Salber and I'll be chatting to a bunch of young people to hear what they've been up to as they deal with this mess of a planet we have inherited. Thank you, parents. We'll be diving into the environment, climate change, the psychological repercussions we have been experiencing, the dreams, the dread, the humor, the hope. Oh my God. Now, what next? Let's meet today's guest. So before further ado, please join me in welcoming today's guest, Stuart Evans. Hi guys. Stuart Evans is an environmental philosopher, a climate activist, animal liberationist, and critical animal studies theorist. He is the founder of the Environmental Alliance Project, an environmental networking organization which aims to solve some of the challenges at the root of climate activism and charity work. As a public speaker, Stuart inspires audiences to consider building a new way of living by sharing his ethical and moral considerations. Thank you for having me, it's a real pleasure. I'm going to kick things off by posing the question, what is an environmental philosopher by your definition? And uh, yeah, what brought you onto this path? I managed to find an opportunity to go to Australia with my partner. Uh, and we went over in October 2019, uh, and then we were sort of hit with the wildfires. We were hit with the global pandemic. We were hit with all these sort of like reality checks that a person might experience like a few times in their life from the global north. And it was a real hard hitting sort of experience where you're going through places that should be like green and lush and beautiful, and you're just seeing ash. You're just seeing like a, a white sort of barren black wasteland. And you're thinking, wow. Wow, like, oh my God. This is real, this is very like, Visceral. So um, when I came back to the UK, everything, everything had shut down. So um, I decided to go to university and basically just kind of scratch that itch of like, well, what's going on? How did we get here? So an environmental philosophy for me, for me is understanding the history of continental philosophy, that in sort of like Europe, all the way from ancient Greece, order, order. Uh, through to the ages of enlightenment in Europe. I think, therefore I am. And what about other people? Do they think therefore they are? Um, and understanding how power structures have been built into our understanding of philosophy and our ontology of the world. So our understanding of how different things just are, the things we take for granted and the things that um, we perceive to be just true. Did I lie? Did I lie? How they're actually um, ideals built by people with power. <laughs> An environmentalist looking at philosophy would go, well, how has it affected the natural and live environment that we are in? So my perspective isn't that of a, a continental philosopher. It's basically like critiquing how philosophy has shaped and um, basically made modernity the way it is, how we've gotten from the ancient Greeks to the Anthropocene. And it's, it's a long lineage of privilege. It's a long lineage of old white men. Sorry. Sorry about us. Uh, it's you know, a lineage of people who have disregarded animals and nature as other and irrational, and those who have uh, disregarded people who aren't white, male, cisgender, able-bodied. So my position as an environmental philosopher is to come in and say, hey, let's challenge these norms that you think are presupposed in society. Let's really dig into this narrative and find out where your presupposed truths are. And let's look to other cultures. Let's see, you know, First Nation indigenous cultures. Let's look at what they were living like two, 3,000 years ago. Let's see their lineage. Let's see how colonialism has impacted them. Let's see how these power structures have really dismantled any kind of uh, other ontology or other kind of uh, way of looking at the world. Brilliant. So then in 2021, you founded the Environmental Alliance Project. Yeah. What was your starting point? And um, yeah, perhaps break that down a little bit for us. What is it that you do there? Yeah. My, my um, 
introduction to all the sort of activism stuff was kind of in the middle of COVID. So when I was trying to get involved in lots of different projects. It's a businesswoman, a TV star, a host, a producer, an actress. And when I was sort of talking to all these different people via, you know, a Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting. Daniel. Oh my God. How, how do we turn this beat off? Wow. Um, I was like, oh, hey, have you heard about the great work that these guys are doing? It seems to match up with yours. They're like, no. Do you know each other? No. No. And I'm like, you're three miles away from each other. Like, how have you not heard of each other? Apparently, I'm forgetful. Because I don't remember the fact that it was just like, hi, I'm so-and-so. They occasionally just need to pull them up for air and go, hi, there's a world around you. Here's some people that are doing the same thing as you. Let's lean on each other rather than kind of like being buried under loads of work, which you feel like is all resting on you. Because this is not going to be changed by individuals, the climate crisis. It's going to be changed by, you know, bringing people together and creating communities of practice. So I saw a space in the market and thought, well, I've got experience in sales, I've got experience in business development, I've got experience in like marketing. Let's see what I can bring to the space. So Environmental Alliance Project basically seeks to bring um, businesses, charities, activism groups, higher education um, institutes, um, you know, sort of local authorities, governments, that sort of stuff, in a same room. There can be a hundred people in a room. A hundred people, and there can be in a one room, right? And a hundred people in the room you could have. And go look. We all have this big problem of climate change at our heart. So that's kind of where we sit, is the collaboration and the networking space. And we can bring in, you know, universities and, you know, bring in leading researchers in these areas and say, look, here's a problem we're struggling with. Can you help solve it? And that's the kind of space I like to move in because I don't think anyone has all the answers, but everyone has a lot of answers. So let's see if a lot of them try and work them out. Amazing. And being a founder in that space, um, what has been the main obstacle you would say you've needed to overcome in order to succeed, whatever success looks like to you? It's the ease at which capitalism can pull you back in to just carry on doing the same old thing. It's, un it's an unfortunate position, especially where, I, where I'm coming from in Hampshire. It's a very privileged area of the UK. There's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of capital, there's a lot of um, deeply held beliefs that are maybe more conservative, that don't help the more uh, liberal or progressive ideology of climate change and with the climate crisis. And it's very easy for them to fall back into their old habits and their old ways. It's, it's the, the cognitive dissonance thing. If it's not happening to you, you don't realize it. So you can start to see the polarities between action and inaction, where inaction is just a point of comfort, it's a point of complacency. Exactly, and, and how would you say we move people out of that space? So like in line with your ethical and moral considerations of your work and biocentrism, where that intersects with capitalism, can we talk about that and, and yeah, pick your brain a little bit? Yeah, so where, where I've been moving at the minute is, is understanding um, where we throw a moral net. And so what I try and do is make people understand that most people in the world, especially in the global north, uh, live in a point of anthropocentricity. And that basically means human-centered morals. Uh, and a lot of the um, work that I've been doing at undergraduate was looking at uh, liberation theory. Uh, and there was a fantastic guy called Enrique Dussel who, who spoke about um, how there's like a center and a periphery. And those in the center are, you know, those in power and those at the periphery are those who are dominated by the center. Um, and he talks about the distance, the moral distance between things. Well, what you want to do is not necessarily what you're going to do. Go. Basically, the more you're put away from something, more you're pushed away from something, the further away from your moral concern it is. So this isn't like a, this isn't like a physical distance. It can be a physical distance. Um, but a lot of the time it's an ideological distance. This is more of a, if it's not, if it's not there and I can't see it, then it doesn't really apply to me morally because I can't affect change. Because it's, it's a huge, huge deal when you're trying to say to people, look, we've got a climate crisis going on and everything you do in a capitalist um, society is unethical, basically, at some form or other. I mean, it's just appalling. It, it sickens me. You know, it's built in a point of exploitation, whether that's in like natural capital, as we see in trees and natural resources, like ores and all that sort of stuff, whether that's in slave or non-documented migrant workers and immigrant workers uh, that are forced into bad conditions and working, whether that's uh, the exploitation of the worker in somewhere like uh, Walmart, or, you know, Tesco working at below living wage. 
at some point in that purchase chain, you're going to be contributing to an ethical thing. What we're trying to do is drag people away from that and say, hey, look, there are ethical alternatives where you can put your money, put your capital into things which can help to make the world a better place. These are small changes that you can do in your day-to-day -day lives. I, I would feel like I'm quite a resilient person when I see things online. I was not resilient when I was actually there in Australia seeing the wildfires, when I'm seeing, you know, fire coming over the hills. I'm going, Jesus, this is real, this is tangible, and this is all because we have mismanaged the Earth's resources. And what I want to make sure is that if people who are less resilient than I am, or who those people who are making those very real connections like I did, how we can keep them in that space and make them feel like they are able to do something rather than feeling helpless and going, I'm going to go back to my point of comfort because I'm scared of this. I don't know how to approach this. And I guess then the question is, how do we translate these theories into concrete steps? But it has to start with that thought, right? That awareness, that recognition. Hugely. Yeah. Stuart, what do you fear? <laughs> Blind, what do I fear? Um, oh, I, I, I fear, why am I, as a person who wasn't born into this world, to do this? Why am I having to do this? Why can't I just go out and travel the world and just see nice places and have an exciting time on this earth with 70 or 80 years I have on this planet? Why do I have to then go out and say, hey, the world's burning, you're all going to die? Why is why is that left to people like us, people having these conversations to really put ourselves out there, burn ourselves out, but are hoarding this wealth and having extravagant lifestyles beyond the imagination of many? And we've still got, you know, three, four billion people on the earth that are living in poverty and all going to bed starving. Like, it's just so screwed up and I can't get over my fear of that. Like, how on earth do we get into this mess and how on earth are we going to get out? Yeah, and thank you for being so honest and, and answering that. Um, but there are a lot of great people like yourself doing a lot of great work and a lot of wins, right? What does a win look like for you? And, and could you share um, your recent one with us? Back in 2021, 20, we held the uh, Winchester's first ever Youth Climate Assembly. And then um, October last year, we held uh, the first ever kind of like People's Climate Assembly. And that helped inform local policy. And that in turn has helped inform the local climate vision to 20, uh, 2030. So it's wins like that for me where I think I've done something impactful in the community. It can be from a very, very small thing. So like somebody coming up to me, like after talking, going, you know what, you've really changed my mind. I'm going to do this. And then six months time, I bump into them again. They said, hey, Queen. Girl, you have done it again, constantly raising the bar for us all and doing it flawlessly. You've really helped me. You've really changed the way I look at things. I've actually done X, Y, and Z. That could be like a really, really big wing for me. So like, I've done something. Like, I've got a tangible person here that's done the thing. Well, that's it for another episode of Now What? Thank you once again for joining me and a special massive thank you to Stuart Evans for sharing those mind-blowing thoughts. If you'd like to find out more about his work, about his brain and what he's doing at the Environmental Alliance Project, have a look in the description box below and you will see a link to the company website, a link to his LinkedIn and his Instagram. If you like this conversation, like this video, subscribe to Sirocco and comment. See you next time.